abundantly above all I could ask or imagine. Come on, lift up a shout. Gonna make some declarations this morning. It's time to be free from the chains that have bound us. It's time to be free from the fear that has paralyzed us. An army that's rising up in this hour. There's an army that's rising up in power. If we've been given the keys to the kingdom and hell won't prevail against us, then church, it's time to rise up and in Jesus' name give a pushback. We're given the keys to the kingdom. Hell won't prevail against us. Church, it's time to rise up and in Jesus give a pushback praise. Give a pushback praise. It's time to be free from the chains that have bound us. It's time to be free from the fear that has paralyzed us. There's an army that's rising up in this hour. There's an army that's rising up in power. If we've been given the keys to the kingdom, and hell won't prevail against us. Then church, it's time to rise up. And in Jesus' name, give a push. We've been given the keys to the kingdom. Hell won't prevail against us. Then church, it's time to rise up. And in Jesus' name, give a push back, pray. Push back, push back, push back in the name of Jesus. Push back, push back, push back in the name of Jesus. Push back, push back, push back in the name of Jesus. Push back, push back, push back in the name of Jesus. How many ready to push back against the enemy today? No more delay. No more delay. Come on, say this with me, all right? Form can prosper against us. We serve the God of angel armies. So we take up our position as we praise. He's confusing the enemy. No weapon form can prosper against us. We serve the God of angel armies. So we take up our position as we praise. He's confusing the enemy. No weapon form can prosper against us. Serve the God of angel armies. So we take up our position as we praise He's confusing. Sing it out. No weapon form can prosper against us. Serve the God of angel armies. So we take up our position as we praise. As we shout, as 
Awake, O sleeper. Awake, O sleeping church. Come alive. There's a sound. Oh, there is a sound in the house. The sound of awakening. The sound of shaking off. The sound of eyes looking up. I hear in Ezekiel. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Whether your countrymen listen or not. Then the Spirit lifted me up. Oh, He's lifting us up. And I heard behind me a loud, rumbling sound. May the glory of the Lord be praised in His dwelling place. Listen, oh God, listen. The sound of the wind of the living creatures rushing against each other and the sound of the wheels behind them a loud rumbling sound the spirit then lifted me up and took me away oh god lift us up and carry us away from our past into our future, serving you in a time like this, says the Lord. Come well, on, let's lift our hands. This uh, 5783 is going to be ending, I'm sorry, 5782 on the Hebrew calendar is ending soon, and we're moving into 5783. The 5782 was the year of the mouth. It was to make decrees. Amen? There's power in our shout. I'll count to three and you lift up a shout. Ready? One, two, three. With a voice of triumph, I will shout with a voice of praise. I will shout with a voice of triumph. I will shout with a voice of praise. I'm gonna shout unto God for the victory. shout with a voice of triumph. I will shout with a voice of praise. I will shout with a voice of triumph. I will shout with a voice of praise. I'm gonna shout unto God for the victory. God is most high over all the earth. Jesus is conquered, Satan is defeated, the enemy is under my feet. Sing that again, all right? Sing that again. He's triumphant. He's triumphant in battle. We are victorious. God is most high over all Got 
to shout for the victory. Shout if you've been set free. Shout. You got to shout for the victory. Shout if you've been set free. Shout. Bridge two. Shout for the victory. Shout if you've been set free. Shout for the victory. Shout if you've been set free. Shout for the victory. Shout if you've been set free. Come on and shout. Yeah. I will shout with a voice of triumph. Shout with a voice of praise. I will shout with a voice of triumph. With a voice of praise, I'm gonna shout unto God for the victory. Yeah, yeah, give the Lord a shout. He's triumphant. He's triumphant in battle. We are victorious. God is most high over all the earth. Jesus is conquered. Got to shout for the victory. Shout if you've been set free. Shout. You got to shout for the victory. Shout if you've been set free. Shout. You got to shout for the victory. Shout if you've been set free. Shout for the victory. Shout if you've been set free. Victory in you today. We prepare our hearts, Lord, for what you want to do today. Help us see ourselves the way you see us. Warriors. Warriors, we break every word curse that was spoken over our lives. We know who we are in you. Not what the world has said. Not what the enemy has lied to us. Lord, we cancel those lies. In Jesus' name. Well, the weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. And when the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to try. And my God will never fail. My God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For oh, the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs. Every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giant. Because I know how the story ends. Oh, yes, I know how the story ends. Sing it out. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory.
you are. Woo! You couldn't even count all the blessings. He's not just a God of the second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance. That's just today. Infinite, infinite amount of chances. Can you just say thank you to the Lord?
every song I say, but you never do. So I hold my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a heart. for a heart singing hallelujah hallelujah help me out I've got one response I've got just one
Come on, let's throw up our hands. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. All that I have is a heart. I know it's not much, nothing else fit for a king. Except for hearts singing high. Yes, I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king. Except for hearts singing high. Come on, stir up the gift. Stir up the gift. It's been dormant. Don't let it stay dormant. Exercise. Exercise that gift.
You worship, you're bringing incense to the Lord. Day and night, night and day, let incense you. Day and night, night and day, let incense you. Rise. Day and night, night and day, let incense Yeah! You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy of it all. testimony he had lost everything and his prayer to God was what can you do with nothing anybody else ever felt that way what do I have I can't offer you anything I'm spiritually devoid let me tell you what God can do with nothing it's miraculous it's miraculous he picks up the pieces and he puts us together. Woo! Thank you. 
Amplified Version, it says, the buckler, the side, not carrying a shield. And the Lord says, those areas of weakness, those areas of blind spot, the Lord says, I am going to firm you up in this season. I am going to strengthen you, says God. And I am your shield, says the Lord. And I am for you, and you will press through, and you will run through a troop and leave over, over a wall, says God. So don't look at those things that you feel that I don't have enough or I'm weak. But the Lord says, I am your shield and I'm your buckler. And the Lord says, I am going to strengthen you. And those areas of weakness will become strength after strength after strength, says, your, says God. I would like to do something. If, uh, if you're a minister in the church, if you uh, lead a church, could you raise your hand? There's quite a few people. Some right back there. There's one more. I thought, I thought there was another couple here. What we just sang is putting people's hearts back together again, and that's it's a really daunting task. So Lord, we just lift up the ministers, those that might be watching right now. And we say, let that song come alive in them. That is, they are the intermediaries between heaven and earth. The brokenness in this world would be healed. The conduit. You would, you would be a conduit through all of us to bring that healing power. The anointing of heaven's healing into the earth to hurting people. No strings attached. Just <laughs> stand with one more song. It's also a confession. It can be a little convicting. But I think you could do it. If the altars where you lead us, take me there, take me there. What you need is just an offering. It's right here. My life is here. I'll be a living sacrifice for you. For the fire. I want to be consumed. I want to be tried. Purify. You take whatever you desire. Say, Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried. Purify. You take whatever you Glory wants to come here. Let it fall. We want it all. If your fire is consuming, fill this place, set it ablaze, and I'll be a living sacrifice for you. The fire, the finer. I want to be consumed. I want to be to say take my life yes, Lord. yes Lord you gave it all for me I give it all back to you today
Lord, we thank you that our heart is the mercy seat and our bodies are the temple of your presence and your fire. Lord, just put your hand on your heart and say, set it ablaze. Set it ablaze, Lord. That we would be a living sacrifice for you. Refine us. That the incense that's burned to be a sweet, sweet, sweet incense to you. We want to burn for you, not for this world. Burn for you. Set us ablaze. All right, how many of you are ready? I think Jane's gonna do a good job of putting some lighter fluid on the fire this morning. Go ahead, greet somebody, tell them you're glad they're here. We are some fellowshipping people, aren't we? <laughs> Welcome to King of Kings. Anybody visiting here for the first time, never been to the campus here? Can we welcome the visitors that are with us? Glad you're here. On your way out, you can get a, a gift from us, a way to remember us and keep yourself caffeinated. Thank you, Lord, that that's legal. <laughs> Um, we we uh, are in the middle of a Watchman conference, and it's uh, an awakening time. That's what we've been hearing a lot. Matt Sorger's been great. Unfortunately, um, our friend from Minnesota, Joshua Giles, wasn't able to get here, right? He was on our schedule. And look, now might be the best time to tell you that Kim Owens had a death in her family. Her brother died. So she's not going to be able to be here tomorrow. I know a lot of people are looking forward to that, but you can understand that her brother passed. So Jane said she would do both sessions this morning, so that was such a manipulative setup. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that. It's true that her brother died, and we pray for Kim Owens. They're doing an amazing work out in Arizona. But anybody here last night get blessed by Jane? <laughs> So I'm sure not going to take a lot of time, but we do want to receive an offering. And when we sang it in that last song, if the altar is where you meet us, right? I'm not standing on a stage right now. I'm standing on an altar. There's a really big difference. Right? So what do you do with an altar? You bring things that you value and you leave them there for God. And often it's things that need to die. Right? That was the whole point. There was a sacrifice. And I heard many people say that the only problem with living sacrifices is they keep climbing off the altar. <laughs> Sing that song again. <laughs> I want to burn for you just tomorrow, not today. <laughs> so we just want to stand up with an envelope in our hand or, or your phone. If you're given online, it's already up there on how you can give online. And, it's made out to King of Kings, but we're going to be blessing all of our speakers that have been here with us. And as I've said before, Elizabeth Tim Fook has just got such an anointing, such a gathering anointing on her life. Can we just thank the Lord for her? And you don't know, you know, there's, you could hear Jane Hammond and, and, and listen to her. She's got a strong prophetic gift. They're, ap they're apostles. Oh, she's a great teacher. So some people just 
have a lot of gifts in one, one package. Elizabeth is not just prophetic and not just gathering, but she's really sharp with administration. And that doesn't always go together. Prophecy and administration don't always go together. So we value that when we find it. <laughs> you could ask the intercessors, why were you late? You know, we said the meeting was going to start at a certain time. Oh, I was in the presence of the Lord. That's way more important than your meeting. And that's, that's true. <laughs> anyway, let's hold it up before I get in any more trouble. The Bible says if you find yourself in a hole, doesn't really, I'm saying this. If you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. <laughs> so, Lord, we, we hold up our offering before you as a, as a privilege, as a sacred aspect of the kingdom of God. It's you. You're the reason that we have this in our hand right now. Jesus said he could do nothing without you, and we say the same, Lord, we could do nothing without you, so thank you for your favor on our lives. Thank you that you've delivered us from confusion and chaos. You didn't give us fear. It's, that spirit of fear has been cast off of us, and you gave us power and love and a sound mind, and, and, and as we stand here today, sound mind, sound health, Lord, we say thank you. Our words fall short. But we want to express our gratitude in so many ways, and this is one of them, Lord, that we could sow into the lives of the people that have been sowing into us. So as we lift it up, Lord, we say, multiply the effectiveness of these funds. Cause them to increase like the loaves and the fishes. All right, so before I have you come up, I just want to say one more prophetic act we're going to do. This is Daniel Kasnowski behind me. Everybody say hi to Daniel. You'll be able to say you knew him before he was famous. How many years ago? Three years you were at the U.S. Open? Five years ago, man, time flies. He sang the God Bless America, right? At the, at the U.S. Open, the tennis thing. With like Everybody's watching on TV. And it's like, yeah, no problem. He finished and he's like waving at everybody. Like, you can call my agent if you want to book me. <laughs> So he's going to sing a prophetic song over us as we bring our offering. So stand up, hold it up, and let's just, could you guys put the lyrics up on there for them so they, they can know what we're singing? Go ahead, you start it, and then I, I'll give you guys the cue when to bring it up. the oppressor who wants to keep me in chains I say my God is a God of freedom don't underestimate his strength I hear that boast of the tyrant seeing my backs to a wall he drew his soul thinking it was over ho, ho. guess he don't know my God at yeah. all <laughs> freedom Freedom, by the power of his mighty hand. Freedom, freedom, come and run into the promised land. Freedom, freedom, Pharaoh be the Lord's man. All right, freedom. bring your offering. Freedom, speak over it as you drop it in. Freedom, he walked me right to that red sea. Army behind. He goes before me with strength and mercy, and he's never lost a single fight. Freedom, freedom, by the power of his mighty hand. Freedom, freedom, he's coming right into the promised land. Let my people go, let my people go, 
Let my people go. Let my people go. Worry, let my people go. Let my people go. Let my people go. Let my people go. Shame, let my people go. Let my people go. Let my people go. Let my people go. Pain, let my people go. Let my people go. Let my people go. Let my people go. Freedom. Freedom. By the power of his mighty hand. Freedom. Freedom. Come and run into the promised land. Freedom. Let my people go, worry, let my people go, let my people go, shame, let my people go, let my people go, pain, let my people go, let my people go, depression, let my people go, let my people go, addiction, let my people go, let my people go, division, let my people go, let my people go, Pharaoh, let my people go, let my people go. Drop the mic. <laughs> so um, I'll just give you a little quick one. Ron and Lisa Kaznowski are Daniel's parents, and they were here with, with us before he was born. So they've been here a long time. And we were sitting in a class uh, on parenting, and uh, we were talking about how we have to speak over the baby that's still in the womb <laughs> and make confessions about what that child is going to be. And, God does exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. So thank you, Lord, for Daniel. Thank you for passing the mantle to the next, 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 next generation. All right, I'm going to ask Elizabeth to come forward. Everybody welcome Elizabeth Tam Food. Well, all right. Well, Daniel actually came was with us in Pittsburgh for our National Prophetic Summit last year. Yay. Well, awesome. All right. Well, I wanted to share. Are you, are you, am I giving the mic back to you, Peter? No, I'm not giving the back. Okay. So Trish isn't looking either. Okay. So, so I'm alone here. Um, okay. So well, I wanted to share a couple dreams. I'm more of like a visions person. I don't know. We, last night we were, when you guys raised your hand, how many dreamers do we have here? Are you guys dreamers? All right. How many visions? Uh, less visions, people, okay? I get tons, tons of visions. I actually all know what it all means usually when I have a vision. When I have a dream, it's the mysteries of all mysteries. I don't know why that's thing. Maybe we need each other, right? So that's so really quick before Apostle Jane gets up this morning. I just want to share one of the things that I, I feel like God is doing is like one of my assignments is coming into right now is about the watchman. And so I feel like God is raising up watchmen the way he did probably the prophetic movement that he's doing is. OK, so I'll let you guys in on a little thing. Don't repeat to any other prophets that I'm telling you this, but they are hard sometimes to work with. OK, here's the reason why. Because we have been taught a lot about individual prophets, and so they rock at that. But when you talk about the company of prophets, it's so hard sometimes for people to really operate in the company of prophets. People don't understand it, but actually part of what you're doing. So here's what the Lord said to me. The Lord said there's individual assignments for prophets, and there, there's only assignments for the company of prophets. So when you have individual prophets, they're rocking at it. But when it comes to the company of prophets, assignments aren't being done because the company of prophets aren't able. So does that make sense? So God's really raising up a whole bunch of companies of prophets that really, like, devotedly really love each other. 
Like really are going to give their hearts towards each other, really are going to do this. So I felt like, I felt this way about the watchmen. I felt like God is going to raise up a group of watchmen that really have each other's backs. They're not going to war alone because there are some of you in here that are warring alone. That you're going to war within a company of, pro, or a company of watchmen. Yeah. Okay? In this area, you guys need to do it together. You need to do it together, okay? So here, here's, how, here's how I break it down. So I have this dream. I have this dream. Since I've been here, it's like an open heaven over, like, my dream life here. So, so the first night it came in, I had, like, a vision coming out of a dream. Then, not last night, but the night, well, uh, I'll tell you my first one before I get to the main one. So last night, I actually, it was, like, so much warfare. I don't know if y'all went to bed with it. I just had a lot of warfare last night going to bed. And then all of a sudden... All of a sudden, I said, Lord, the enemy's trying to rob my sleep. And so, so after that, I fell back asleep, and I went deep into a dream. And I, I woke up at, well, before I did that, I woke up at 4.18, and I heard the Lord said, Luke 4.18. Okay, all right, I need my phone because somehow I can't memorize. You know you forget everything when you get in the pulpit, right? You forget all anything you memorize. So, so here's what it says. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to, to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. And I felt like the Lord emphasized this last night out, out of this dream. I felt like he said this. He said, decree over this region, they would have eyes to see. Yeah. Eyes to see what I'm doing in this season as watchmen, that they're, re- they're not going to miss things. They're going to have eyes to see. Okay, I know that's not really, but that's what God spoke to me out of that, okay? So to go back, that was last night. Then go back to the night before. The night before, I, I, I'm in this room, in this dream, and I go in. It's a master bedroom, and I go in. I'm, I'm actually in the dream, so I'm in, like, the doorway between the bathroom. You know, in a master ba- bedroom, it has the master bath. So I'm in the between this doorway, um, and all of a sudden, I see there's a woman on the bed and then another woman at the door. She's in the door, like, leading out the room. And all of a sudden, I saw, um, I saw this woman, and she was floating, which the Lord had to tell me, the only thing he told me in the dream, that it was somebody, a prophet that was a woman, okay? And all of a sudden, I saw this alligator coming up, like I'm like, God, why can't you give me running in the tulips? You know, like, I get these, like, crazy dreams since I was a kid. Like, I have, like, I'm like, you know, your friends are like, oh, man, I'm just running in the fields with Jesus, holding hands. And, and I'm like, well, I saw somebody would be trying to be bit by an alligator, like, you know, and it's like you're having to pray. But anyway, so go back to this dream. So I saw this alligator coming up, and it was going to bite the leg of the lady that was floating, right, the prophet woman. And, um... I noticed that the person on the bed in the doorway didn't see. I was the only one seeing it. And so I go, why are they not seeing? So as I'm trying to warn her, this alligator's coming to get her leg, to bite her leg because I saw it coming up. Um, All of a sudden, supernaturally, she was pulled out and the alligator started to go down. So as the alligator's going down, I jump on the bed because I was like, heck, that thing's not coming after me. But anyway, so I jump on the bed and all of a sudden I look down and it's like a glass, the the floor of the master bedroom was glass and I can see the alligator under the the glass underneath swimming around and it was, I was like, man, that alligator was bigger than I thought. And I felt that was like really significant in the dream. And then I said, I said, you know, it's, and it looked old. I don't know why I was like, I don't know that you can have, I don't know what an old alligator looks like, but I remember thinking, man, that's an old alligator. And so, so then I woke up from the dream. So I come out with my hair all crazy, come out and I'm like, Trisha, I got to tell you this dream I had. And so here's what, here's the point I'm making to this dream. I love what Trisha shared because when you're together as watchmen, one person may have a piece to something that you don't have. And so you have to make sure that you're not assuming what you think. The only thing God spoke to me in that dream, because I, I never want to assume the other part of the dream. The only thing is I knew that it was a woman prophet that that, that alligator was going after. So, all right, so Trisha, come up here and tell when I, when I, t- so here's the thing. I go, bam, okay, I get it. I get it. It actually is part of what God's doing. So she's coming. 
she's waiting but coming? Okay. All right, so when I tell her this, because I did tell her that alligator was going after the leg of the prophet woman, whoever it is. We don't know who it is. Okay. So I'm looking it up because I was telling her what Gimel and one of the definitions, and I don't have my notes. Here. It's at 5783. Five, okay. five, <laughs> I know. It's 5783. And um, we're heading into this new year, and it's a picture of a man running. And um, I forget the rest of it because I'm on my notes with me. But it's a picture of a man running. And in your dream, you said that they were, it, it, it grabbed hold of your it leg. Was, it was going to, not my leg, their leg. Or their leg or whoever's yeah. leg. But say the enemy wants to prevent you from moving forward. And one of the other definitions that it said that, that Christ was running after us to give us the riches and the glory that, that he wants us to have. And see, the enemy would do everything to stifle you and hold you back by trying to grab hold of your leg and pull you back. And that's why we're going to have to be really intentional about what the Spirit of the Lord is saying in moving forward in this season and putting that tent peg through, like Jael did, through Sisera's head, putting that tent peg through the mindsets. All right? We cannot move forward in this season, which is coming out of this dream, with the old that would hold us back and go around that mountain again with that old stuff that keeps us on, on lockdown. Right? Yeah, and Trisha, Trisha actually told me, she said part of the new year, it was something connected to the leg and all of that. So, so, so I'm sure she'll describe it when she talks more about 5783. But do you see how important it is to be around other believers that understand the watchman anointing? So in this region, I will tell you, so in this region, when I, the first time we came in here to try to gather young prophets, here's what I felt. I felt there were a lot of amazing young prophets in this region, but what was happening was everybody was on their own. Do you notice that in these re in the churches here in this region? There's something in you that makes sure that you're not partnering with that type of mindset with what God is trying to do with gathering the watchmen in this area. Because what you're going to do is say, well, I can do it on my own. I could do this. Or please, for the sake of all of us, I have to deal with this in the prophetic movement. Please stop trying to become famous. Watchmen and prophets, consider the prophets what for suffering. Not for becoming famous, for suffering. So, okay, okay, nobody wants to hear that. Okay, so, so here, here's the thing. Be the most amazing watchman you can be. Be submitted somewhere. Be a, get around other believers that are want to watch at the same time. So I had a component. I had the dream component. She had part of the interpretation of it. And so what we're saying is if we are going to transform regions, if we're going to transform this, we need all hands on deck. Is that good? Yeah. All right. All right. So we're going to, y'all aren't going to run by yourselves. No. Okay. I heard that and Jesus heard that. Okay. All right. All right. Oh, oh, well, let me tell you, introduce really quick Apostle Jane Hammond. So I don't know if you guys know this, but ever since I was a teenager, which was just a few years ago, um, nobody wants to be teenagers anymore. But anyway, so um, she has impacted my life since then. And so for me, I owe a lot of anything. She actually prophesied international young prophets to me. And so a lot of anything you see that we do is from a prophetic word from her. And so I really, really honor her. I really like appreciate the gift of God inside of her. And not only that, I appreciate who she is. And so why don't we just stand and welcome Apostle Jane Hammond. Amen. Amen. Let's stand to our feet and let's just take a moment to pray in the spirit, okay? Just lift your hands up. Just begin to pray in the spirit right now. Let's just release an atmosphere. That praise and worship was just amazing. So, Father, we just thank you, God, for the atmosphere of heaven coming down in the midst of us right now, Lord. We thank you, God, for the release of your anointing, God, that you're stirring up within your people. Father, I just release right now, God, the anointing, Father. God, open our eyes, God, even as this prophetic word has come, Lord, 
And even as it was prophesied last night, God, you are releasing eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts that are ready to receive and perceive. Lord, as we pray in the Spirit, and Lord, the Word says we stir up our most holy faith. And so, God, we activate our faith today, God, to enter into that season of more. God, we thank you, God, that we are going to run this year, God. We are going to run and not be weary, God. We are going to walk and we are not going to faint. And Father God, even in that dream, Father God, that that prophet, that woman that was a prophet, Father, I thank you, God, that it's a picture, too, of the church that's rising up in this season of time, Father God. The, the bride church, the Esther church, God, that's rising up prophetically, God. She's coming into a time to see and hear. She's coming into a time to make war on the enemy. She's coming into a time to overthrow the thrones of Jezebel. God, the only answer to Jezebel is a righteous church rising up. God, shaking ourselves free from every Leviathan spirit that wants to arise. Lord, we decree today, God, we are part of that church. We are part of one another. God, we are part of your bride. And Lord, I thank you, God, you're going to give us the ability to see the strategies of hell, but also, God, the purposes of heaven, and that we will be able to arise in this season of time to accomplish every kingdom purpose in this new Hebraic year. Father, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Now, before you're seated, let me say, before we leave 5782, um, I, as I looked it up, it actually comes from a word in the, in the, the Hebrew, which is the word er. Everybody say er. You know, it's like er. But you know what it actually means? It means to open up the eyes and to awaken. Come on, here at the end of 5782, I believe God has brought us here to open up our eyes. Some of you that don't dream are going to start to dream. Some of you that don't have visions are going to start to have visions. Today, we're going to take, take off the lid, and we're going to bring you into a new place of spiritual discernment. So I want you to lift up your hands all over this place. Father, I thank you, God, for a fresh mantle, God, a double portion mantle, Father, a mantle of the Holy Spirit, God, that you're releasing upon each and every one of us that are gathered here today, each and everyone that's watching online. Lord, we just decree, Father God, that whatever level we've operated in in the past, it has become insufficient to carry carry us into the future. And so, Lord, we thank you, Father God, that you've brought us here to give us a new mantle for the new day, God, a new mantle for this new season, a new mantle for this new year, Father, so that we truly can advance, God. We can break out. We can break through, Father God, and we can arise as a mighty army in this place. In Jesus' name, let's give the Lord a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Woo. Amen. You guys can be seated. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, it is really an honor, privilege. I just absolutely love your apostles. I just think they're amazing. I love the worship here. I love the atmosphere. I love their hearts. How long have we known each other? When was that? 2003, 2004. I was like 12, you know. No, I'm just, <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm kidding. But no, it, I mean, you know what? I mean, we've, we've walked together. We've run together for a long time. So um, they've done an amazing thing in creating an atmosphere for God to move. Let's just give them a hand. Amen. Amen. Um, I do want to let you know some of the resources. I'm going to be speaking this morning on um, the watchman anointing and the spirit of discernment. Um, and I just, I feel like... Um, as much as I want to teach you, there's, there's an impartation in this this morning. Um, but I have uh, my most recent book. Um, well, it's not my most recent, but this is actually, uh, I think, one of the most important books that I've written. And it's called Discernment, An Essential Guide for Hearing the Voice of God. And, uh, and in here I do a lot of very in-depth teaching about what to do with the gift of discernment. Because really, honestly, what I have seen um, is... That people that have a gift, how many of you feel like you operate in a gift of discernment? That's why you're at a watchman conference, right? Um, so, so what I've experienced through the years, and I've taught this subject for probably well over 30 years, is that people that have the gift of discernment, because there was so little teaching in the body of Christ about what to do with what you see, that I found that people did usually one of two things. Number one, they either did nothing which how many know that's the wrong thing? 
or they did the wrong thing. I, this book is full of all the wrong things I did, okay? <laughs> Learn from me the wrong things that I did so that you don't repeat them, okay? Um, because honestly, when God started activating discernment in me, I just really wanted to kill everybody and tell God they died, okay? Um, and... and uh, Okay, seriously. And so I actually had to learn to walk in love. I had to learn to walk in mercy. I'll talk about that a little bit this morning. Uh, somebody's saying, yes, that's me. Okay. <laughs> um, but, but I think that this is really probably the greatest need in the body of Christ today is to operate in a higher level of accurate discernment and to know what to do with the things that we're seeing. And so I appreciate the exhortation not to do it alone, not to be by yourself. Um, my father-in-law, has a, Bishop Bill Hammond, has a very profound statement that he makes in that regard. He says, it is the banana that gets separated from the bunch that gets peeled and eaten. Okay. And uh, some of you are, yes, isn't that profound? Yes. <laughs> And so um, I have actually learned to operate within the company that God's called me to. Um, locally, I have an amazing team that helps me watch and pray. Um, and But this is going to really, I think, help to catapult the church to a higher place of being able to give ourselves permission to see the things that we need to see and to be able to operate in a greater level of power. And so I want to encourage you about that. Um, I do. My most recent book is a book called Declarations for Breakthrough, How to Agree with the Voice of God. This really teaches the principles of the decree. And if, um, and if you're not familiar with those, um, I really want to encourage you that Psalms 82 verse 10 says, open your mouth with a mighty decree. I will fulfill it now, you'll see. The words that you speak, so shall it be. If we're in the decade of the pay, okay, this is the Hebraic decade of the mouth, Okay, we've got to understand the power behind the words that we speak. And we've got to know how to write a decree. We've got to understand how to speak a decree. A decree is not meant to be read. It's meant to be spoken. Do you understand you can't even get saved without opening your mouth? If you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Okay, so one of, the, one of the things that you can start doing right away is just opening your Bible. Remember the Bible? Yeah. Opening up your Bible and start reading it out loud. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. And I just believe that there's, there's sound. It's so important that we're releasing sound into the atmosphere in this season of time. I, I'm not going to preach that, okay? But th those are resources. I also have a book called The Deborah Company, and here I talk. In Discernment, I talk about being a watchman. In Deborah Company, I talk about being a watchman as well. This is a book called, it's just been updated and expanded, um, A Prophetic Call for Women to Fulfill Their Divine Destiny. Um, this is really not just a book for women. I've had so many men read this book. I would like to market it and say, men, if you read this book, you'll understand your wives. But it's not true, so. <laughs> it's, I'm sorry, it's not true, okay? Because there are some things that are beyond understanding, okay? So, um, Anyway, it's a, it's a great book. It's a great book for men, and it's got a ch whole chapter in here about the hard passages that have been used to keep women silent. You know, like let a woman keep silent in church. I go into the original language. You, you, can't, just, you can't just go and say, well, that was then, this is now. That doesn't work. You can't do that with the scripture, okay? You, but you can go into the original language and find out the original intent of the author, okay? So that's what I've done with some of the passages that have been used. And why I'm bringing this up this morning is because there's such a religious spirit up here. And it fights against strong women. And even some strong women that go into ministry, they, they take on a wrong spirit. You know, because they're having to fight against something, they almost become that thing that they hate. And so I really encourage women, because I have a whole chapter in here about the, De the Deborah anointing versus the Jezebel spirit. And, and I think that part of our, our great national warfare right now is against a Jezebel throne. Jezebelic thrones that have been established over the nation. 
And I just think that um, God's, it, God's not just going to use women. God's going to use men and women. Because how many understand Jezebel is a spirit, and spirits are neither male nor female, okay? But Jezebel is personified as a woman, and so I think, I just, I just think it's God's justice to see women take Jezebel down. I think it, I think it, I think it gives God joy. Okay, <laughs> um, and then I have a book on dreams and visions because y'all are lots of dreamers, um, understanding and interpreting God's messages to you. So those are some of the resources that I bought. There's other things back there, uh, but I especially wanted to just highlight the ones that talk about being a watchman. Um, I want to start out by reading a scripture for you this morning out of Habakkuk chapter 2. I'm going to do a little bit of teaching, a little bit of storytelling, a little bit of impartation, a little bit of prophetic stuff, okay? Um, but I'm going to start in Habakkuk chapter 2, and it says, in verse 1, it says, I will stand my watch. Let's just say that. I will stand my watch. And I think that that's really the call. God is saying, I'm looking for people that are willing to stand their watch. So it goes on to say, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me. Isn't that interesting language? I will watch to see, and then he speaks audibly. So how many understand that watching and hearing have to go hand in hand? I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. You know, in the, in the, um, in the Old Testament, we see the picture of the watchman. And generally, watchmen in the days of Israel were stationed two primary places. Number one, they were stationed on the walls of the city. Okay, they were stationed on the ramparts of the city walls. And the watchmen were surrounding the city. They were positioned um, periodically around the walls. And they would watch and see who was approaching. Was it a friend? Was it a foe? Okay, they were watching to see what enemy was approaching. They were watching to see what friend was approaching. And they had to have a certain level of discernment to know which was which. Okay? The second place that a watchman was stationed is they were stationed in watchtowers that watched over the harvest fields. How many know that we need watchmen that know how to watch over the harvest fields? Amen? So we've got we've to be on the, on the wall of the church on the wall of our city, on the gates of our nation, and New Jersey is a gate state. Let me say that again. New Jersey is a gateway state. And for that reason, God is saying, I want to raise up a company of watchmen in this state. I know that in the uh, Chuck and Dutch's 50-state tour in 2003, they named New Jersey the Watchman State. And so that's why I believe that God wants to assemble a company of prophetic watchmen. Now, how many of you are not from New Jersey? Because I know that there's a, there's a lot of people. I just believe that New Jersey has a special calling on it. But I also believe that this region, remember, based on the dream that I had about the lion, the vision I had about the lion, that God is raising up watchmen throughout this region who know how to watch and know how to pray. And I was reminded, I'm, I'm not sure what year I was here last, 18 or 19? 19. 19, okay. Um, I, we were here with a, a, a young prophet named Jonathan Stidham. And I know the last morning we were here, the Lord spoke about how God was going to raise up watchmen that were going to thwart terrorist attacks. How many remember that? Um, and then um, I left the meeting and I went to the airport in Newark and every New York City airport, Jonathan went to, a, I think, a different airport even. And every single airport in the New York region was completely shut down because of a terrorist threat. Did y'all realize that? that was like that afternoon? Fulfilled prophetic word, okay? And we just sat there and we prayed. Um, every single flight was canceled out of the entire New York region. Because of a terrorist threat that never materialized. Because I believe watchmen prayed and interceded. And the word intercede actually has a connotation of getting in the way. 
See, God can actually give us insight that shows us how to get in the way of what the enemy has planned. Amen? And so I believe that God's raising up a company here in New Jersey that really knows how to watch and pray, not just for the state, but for the region, for the nation, because this is a tipping point state. In other words, a tipping point determines which way something tips. It has, a, a, it has an ability to determine which way a nation will go. And so there's certain states, certain regions that God is raising up, that he's raising up prophetic companies, he's raising up watchmen that know how to pray strategic prayers. And you can look around this room and you can say, what could a group this size do? Well, I'm telling you, just like we prophesied last night and then I found that, uh, that, that Apostle Tricia spoke yesterday, th- there is a remnant anointing that God is raising up a, even a small company of people that know how to pray. You know, God has never had to save by many. As a matter of fact, sometimes he actually goes through whole stories where he proves I'm going to save by few. That's the whole story of Gideon, okay? I'm not going to save by many. I'm going to save by few. And so I believe that New Jersey is a tipping point state. There's going to be times of strategic warfare, times of strategic prayer, times of strategic gathering that God will speak, I believe even over the next year, that will say, okay, now it's time to shift this. Now it's time to shift that. And I believe that as shaking begins to come to this region, I believe it's going to be important not to just have a year, a word for the year, but a word for the month. Okay, to see what is, what is God doing, what needs to shift this month. Amen. And so I believe that God's going to kind of fine-tune our hearing, fine-tune our ability to see things in the spirit because this is a tipping point region. Now, um, years ago, I think it was way back, like maybe 2010, 2011, um, I heard this phrase, tipping point. In a moment of prayer um, in our services, let me just say, a lot of times you hear me say, um, God spoke this to me in prayer. God spoke this to me in prayer. Hey, if you're waiting God to just chase you down and give you a word, it's probably not going to happen. Okay, we've got to spend some time in prayer. We've got to spend some time waiting on the Lord. We've got to spend some time listening. And so I had this word, and the Lord said, it's a tipping point season. And the Lord says, I'm going to cause tipping points to take place within nations. I think it was 2011. And, um, and I, was, I was, you know, contemplating the, the concept of tipping point. We all kind of understand that a tipping point is a point where something can go one way or the other, right? And so I, I had a guy that was in our intercession group, and he was this brilliant um, scientist guy that worked for Cisco, and and so I, I shared this word, and and I would always tease him because whenever I would share something, he would always come back to me to give me some scientific perspective on what it was that I was saying, and I, I would joking, jokingly say to him that he spoke blonde to me <laughs> because he would take these massive scientific concepts, and I would be like, okay, you're going to have to, like, dumb that down for me so that I really, I know I'm not dumb, okay, but I would say, I, I would say, you're going to have to, like, break that down for me so that I understand it, and so um, uh, I, I tease about him speaking blonde to me, and blondes, please don't be offended, okay? Um, I, I tell blonde jokes um, for two reasons. Number one, I know I'm not stupid, and number two, I know I'm not blonde, okay? So <laughs> let's just be honest, okay? All right, so so he, so he said, he said, I want you to understand this concept of tipping point. He said, because he, he's like, if you have to like tip something that's very, very heavy, like say if you go out and you have to, you want to like tip a car over. I was a little alarmed at his analogy, but he said, if you want to tip a car over, he said, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to get under it and you've got to lift. And so how do, what do we do? We lift through prayer. We lift through times of worship. He said, but if you're trying to tip something that's heavy and that's large, which is what we're doing in a nation right now, we're tipping something that's heavy and large. He said, you got to get under it. You got to lift it. But at some point you have to shift. You can't just keep lifting it because that doesn't work. You have to at some point get under it and shift, right? And he said, the way that you shift is, he said, he said, you've got to change your positioning. And I think there's been a lifting that's been going on, but now the Lord's saying there's a shifting 
that must take place, okay? And how do we shift? I think we shift through prophesying. We shift through decreeing. Come on. And then after you shift, then you've got to push. And here's the, the problem with the church. We think lifting and shifting is enough. No, no, no. We've got to keep pushing. We've got to keep pressure on the issues until, everybody say until, until if we're talking about a car, until that, that car comes to a place where you've pushed hard enough, you've pushed long enough that it hits the tipping point. Now, what happens at the tipping point is one of two things. Number one, if you stop pushing, it's going to come back on top of you. And I think the church has given up too soon in some issues. And it's come back on top of us. And we've had to start over. Come on, is that true? Or we can push a little harder, a little longer, and suddenly, everybody say suddenly, the thing that has worked against you, speaking of gravity, the thing that has worked against you suddenly begins to work for you. Come on. And I think that we really are, are coming to that point where things that have pushed against us, things that have worked against us, God's going to flip them. Amen. But the church has got to stay in position. We've got to continue to press in with revelation. Last year's revelation doesn't move us into this next year's victory. Amen. We've got to understand that we've got to constantly press in. We've got the word. We've got the foundation of the word. But God is constantly wanting to bring us fresh revelation to understand God's plans, to understand the enemy's plans, and to understand how to cooperate with heaven to cause a tipping point to come to, come to pass and to see things begin to flip into their proper positioning. Amen. I think it's very interesting. I love the word revelation in Scripture because it comes from a, a Greek word, apokalypsis. It's where we get the word apocalypse, okay? But apokalypsis, apo means to remove, and kalypsis means the veil or the curtain. So in other words, if you've got curtains on this window... You've got all kinds of stuff happening outside the window, but if you've got a veil or a curtain on the window, you can't see it. So you don't know how to respond to it. You're unaware of what's taking place, perhaps right there within your, within your range of vision, but you can't see it because there's something obscuring it. Apocalypsis means to remove the veil. Everybody do this, to remove the veil and to remove the curtain, amen? That's what happens with discernment. God begins to remove the veil, begins to remove the curtain so that we can clearly see the things that God is assigning to us, amen? Now, let me read you a scripture out of Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. Hang on just a second. Daniel chapter 4 declares this. It says, the decision is by the decree of the watchers. Now, the watchers could either be an angelic host that have been sent to protect. It literally means wakeful, watchful ones. But it's also speaking, I believe, of a watchman company. I think the church for too long has had a que sera, sera, Whatever will be, will be mentality. And we don't understand that the decision about the tipping point, the decision about a nation, the decision about a region is actually by the decree of those that are watching. So when we watch, we need to learn how to make decrees. And the sentence by the word of the holy ones, that's us, in order that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to whomever he will, and sets it over the lowest of men. In other words, he establishes structure. He establishes order when the enemy wants only chaos. How do we overthrow chaos? How do we overthrow the authority of chaos that I spoke about last night? We establish divine order. How do we do that? The decisions are by the decree of the watchers. How many want to be watchers? Amen. Let me read you another scripture. Isaiah 62 verse 6 says, On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen. All day 
and all night, they will never keep silent. Listen to this. You who remind the Lord, take no rest for yourselves. Now listen, does God need reminding? <laughs> God does not need reminding, but we need reminding. So I think as we remind the Lord, what we're actually doing is reminding ourselves. So that's where we go back and we say, Lord, you said in your word. Lord, you said prophetically over my life. Come on, if you're battling for the life of one of your children like I shared with you last night, you know what I did? I reminded the Lord. I said, God, prophetically, this is what's been spoken over my daughter's life. Prophetically, this is what you've decreed over her life. Prophetically, these are the promises from your word that have been written in the Bible. Lord, I'm reminding you what your word said because guess what? What it was doing was activating my faith to begin to see the turnaround. So the watchmen are watching not just what's happening in the spirit today, but we've got to watch over the words. How many know it says that God watches over his word to perform it? God watches over his word, but we've got to watch over the words. That's why it's beneficial to go back and read prophecies that have been spoken over the state. Not just last year or the year before, but let's go back and read the prophetic words, the prophetic promises that have been spoken over the last number of decades. That's why it's good to go back in history and see the victories that God has given to your state through history so that you can remind the Lord, God, you know what? You brought major tipping points in the Revolutionary War right out of this place, the seat of, uh, of, the, the seat of beginnings in this nation nation, I think New Jersey, if I'm correct, was the first state to sign the Bill of Rights. Was that true? Is that amazing? See, you know, when you go back, you remind the Lord of that. God, when our rights are being taken away, when our rights are being rolled over, God, you made us a forerunner state that signed the Bill of Rights for our nation. God, we are a state that's going to watch over that, that's going to war over that, that's going to contend over our destiny. Come on, that's how we watch. That's how we remind the Lord. And it says, do not keep silent. Your mouth has got to be moving. Your mouth has got to be decreeing. Do you realize that the word meditate? See, I'm just, I'm shaking you this morning. Because, see, we get stuck in this meditative process. The word meditate in Scripture doesn't mean think it over and over in your mind. Do you know what it actually means? It means to murmur it under your breath. To move your mouth. To make a sound. Even if you're not speaking it out loud. Come on, when we're, when we're learning Scripture, we, we can't just memorize it in our head. We've got to speak it out of our mouth. And God is wanting a sound to come out of New Jersey. It's not just a matter of watching. It's a matter of the decree that the decision is by the sound, the decree that the watchers make. In this decade of pay, we've got to understand how to align our mouth with the word of the Lord and not keep silent. And constantly remind the Lord, remind ourselves, remind the atmosphere, remind the principalities and powers, remind the angelic force. You realize that angels listen for the sound of God's word. Come on, we're maybe not bossing angels around, but they're listening for the sound of God's word. And then they're mobilized to go out and carry it out. Do you know angels don't know what you think? Angels are not omnipotent. They are not all-knowing. What do angels know? They know what we speak. By the way, demons are also not all-knowing. Demons also know what, do not know what we think, but they know what we say. Some of you have been binding the devil. I'm telling you, you need to be start binding yourself, okay? Because you don't even need a devil. You're speaking curses against yourself, against your family, out of your own mouth. Come on. Lay your hand on your head and say, I bind myself in Jesus' name, okay? Come on, sometimes we've got to stop speaking the negative. We've got to stop, spe stop speaking what the enemy has decreed and start saying what God has decreed. Stop cursing the United States of America. Get your mouth in alignment with what God has said because God has said America shall be saved. 
We need to get our mouth in alignment with what God is saying. And if we want to be watchmen, we've got to learn how to do that. The decision is by the decree of the watchers. Now, in my book on discernment, I talk about six areas of discernment. I'm just going to give those to you quickly. Um, and let me just say this. Um, I've been operating in discernment probably most of my life. I wasn't saved till I was 14. I was filled with the Holy Spirit when I was 16. I didn't really have a language for discernment. But when we first started our church in Florida, there was a, um, we were doing conferences um, back in the, in the early 1980s. And we had a young prophet come to America that some of you may have heard of. He was very young, just starting out in the nation. His name was Kim Clement. How many remember Kim? And he came, and it was one of the first conferences that he came to in, um, in Florida. I was, I think uh, when he came, let's see, my, my son was maybe, he was in his first year. So I was probably 25 years old, 25, 26 years old. We were pastoring a church. We had three small children. God was activating all this discernment in me. I didn't know what to think about some of the things I was seeing. Nobody talked about discernment back then. And so he, I was at this conference, and I was in the back. I had three little kids, like, hanging on me. And um, I had a three-and-a-half-year-old, a two-year-old, and a newborn. Sila, okay? And a new church, and we were birthing the prophetic movement, okay? So we were doing one conference a month. I was basically exhausted all the time, okay? But he, he, I'm in the back. And he's up ministering, and he calls me, and he says, this young lady right here with all those kids, could you just, could you just come up here? And, um, and so I went up, and he laid hands on me, and he said, now listen, I don't know who you are, because he had just come in, like, in the middle of the service. And he said, but listen, the Lord showed me that you're called to be a watchman for this ministry. This is before anybody was really using that term. He said, God's called you to be a watchman for this ministry and a watchman in the body of Christ. And the Lord says, I, he's anointed you to see the snake and to see the wolf. And then there were some other things that he said. So about a couple months later, we had some things happen at the ministry where, without going into a lot of detail, um, we had a staff member that was basically a really um, demonically planted there, really. And she was actually Bishop Hammond's secretary. And she seemed to have all kinds of gifts. But I'm telling you, have you ever just met somebody and it's like, ooh. And she, she had a great smile. She lifted her hands in worship. She did all the right things. But every time I got around her, there was just something in me. Right? Okay. And so I never trusted her. But Bishop trusted her, okay? So it was like, well, I'm going to have to, like, learn to, you know. And listen, and so she ended up causing some division, and it's the, it's the closest thing we've ever come to a split. But way back in the beginning, she split off a couple of staff members and a couple of church families when we were just starting and, um, and then kind of led them, led them away by just spreading some really horrific lies. And so when we got together as a leadership team to kind of, like pray and, and like talk about what had happened, you know, I just, I kind of made this statement. I said, you know, well, I just, I, I just never really trusted her. And Bishop turned and looked at me and he said, well, why didn't you say something? And I said, well, my mother taught me if you can't say something nice, <laughs> then you don't say anything at all. And how many understand that discernment is no excuse to go around talking about people, Okay. But if you're talking about speaking to your spiritual leader about something, then that's a whole nother diff that's a whole nother matter. And so Bishop said, listen, you got that prophetic word that you were anointed to see the snake and to see the wolf. That's the gift of discernment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my hands and I'm going to lay my hands on you and I'm going to activate that gift of discernment so that you've got permission to start activating that and telling me and the other leaders, what it is you're seeing and what it is that you're hearing. I was already seeing and hearing. I just didn't know what to do with it. And so he laid his hands on me, and he prayed. I didn't feel anything. I didn't, like, get Holy Ghost shivers or anything. I just, he prayed, he activated it. But the next day, we went to church. And I'm a people person. I love people. Um, and, and so I went to church. 
Oh, hi, good to see you. Oh, give them a hug. And as I'm giving them a hug, apocalypsis happens. And all of a sudden, I'm seeing all the stuff. And then, like, I'm up leading worship, and I'm looking back there going, oh, Jesus, what a, oh, my gosh. I'm seeing people's thoughts. I'm seeing people's hearts. I'm seeing all this stuff. So literally, after like two weeks of this, I went back to Bishop and I said, you put your hands back on me. And you take this back, okay? I do not want this. This is awful. What an awful, awful thing, okay? Please make this stop. And you know what he said? He said, no. He said, you're going to learn to operate. This is a gift of the Holy Spirit. I said, it sure doesn't feel like a gift. It feels like a curse. Come on, how, how many people are, are relating to this, okay? And it's literally like I, God had to take me through a process of learning to operate in this gift. And it was not pleasant for pretty much for anybody. Because I would see things and I would, they just said, just come and share with us. My, my bishop and my husband, two of the most mercy-motivated kind-hearted people that you'll ever meet. Never think a negative thought about people. And when I first started discerning, that's all I was doing. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> okay, and I would go and I'd say, well, this person has this issue in their life, and this person has this issue, and this person has this issue. What are you going to do about it? And they'd be like, okay, well, we're going to pray. How many are grateful that Mercy triumphs over judgment. You know, before you judge somebody's problem, you need to understand there's always a process with God. How many are glad that God didn't just put a giant X through your name when you were not doing good? Come on, how many are glad that God gave you a second chance? How many are glad that God didn't just let you be kicked out of a process when God was trying to draw you back to him when you weren't doing so well? Come on, so sometimes discernment is not the end of the matter. Sometimes we got to see what we're seeing, but then also hear the heart of God and the process for the person to bring redemption because ultimately that's what the gift is for. Listen, I have people that are leaders in my church today that I discerned all kinds of very unrighteous things operating in their life when they first come to, came to us. We deal with sin but we love the person, and we walk with them until they come to a place of freedom. That's the heart of Christ, amen? I'm really super glad my leaders did that with me. Okay? However, sometimes there's wolves. Well, let me give you a good example of a wolf. Um, I was on the worship team. I was, I was worshiping the Lord one night. And this man walked in the back door of our church. We were packed out that night. He walked in. He sat on second to last row, put his hands in the air, started worshiping. He was dressed light nicely. He was a nice-looking man. He was lifting his hands and worshiping God, seemed to be entering into the spirit. The second that he walked in, I wanted to go back there and punch him in the face. <laughs> Just those that are excited about punching, please don't ever please go punch anybody in the face, okay? Please don't ever do that, okay? But I'm just telling you, there was this anger that rose up in me for no explainable reason. When there is no reason, it's because there's a reason. Okay, we'll talk about a couple of those reasons, but let me just say this, because the reason could be you. That was spoken by a mercy-motivated person right there. Okay, say that again. But let me just say this. I... I was sexually abused by a man that had a beard when I was a child. So when I started discerning, I had to separate out the fact that I got a reaction. I got triggered by men that had facial hair. Any man that has facial hair, don't worry. I've gotten over it, okay? I've gotten healed, all right? But you know what? If you're not careful, your own issues can become the filter that you view people, and you can think you're discerning. Well, actually what's happening is you're getting triggered, and you need to get healed. Okay? I don't have time to really preach on that, but let me just say that's a warning to say we need to search our own hearts. 
about people. Um, there's, a, there's a little story that we like to tell in that regard, and I'll tell you about the wolf. But um, there, was a, there was a little boy that thought that he would play a trick on his grandfather. And while his grandfather slept on the couch, he took a piece of Limburger cheese. You know that super stinky cheese? Have you, have you ever smelled Limburger cheese? It's horrible. Like, get it out of your house, okay? But it's super stinky cheese. And he took a little piece of it and stuck it right in his grandpa's mustache when he was sleeping. So when his grandpa woke up, his grandpa went, wow, this room really stinks. And he walked around the house. Whew, this whole house stinks. Oh, my gosh. So he steps out on the porch and he goes, wow, the whole world stinks. <laughs> and so the analogy is this. When the whole world stinks, it's probably something under your own nose. <laughs> if all you keep doing is discerning, oh, that leader's controlling. Oh, that person's control. We had a lady that came to our church. She said she was there three weeks. She was leaving. She was fed up with us after three weeks. The pastor's controlling. The worship leader's controlling. The life group leader's controlling. The nursery workers are controlling. This person, what was the issue? She wasn't in control. Something under her own nose. If all you do is discern less, 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 less. Oh, that person's less. That person's lusting. That person's, oh my gosh, the whole world's lusting. Can we check our own heart? Okay? So whatever the issue is, okay, the first thing we've got to do is check our own heart. But sometimes you'll have a reaction for no reason, and usually there's a reason. And if it's not your own heart, then what is the reason? So I had this, re this, this reaction to this guy that came in, sat on the back row, and was worshiping. Later on in the service, we did an activation. We put somebody in a chair. We said, anybody that has a word for this person, come on up here. We were learning to do activations, and he came up and got in line. I was holding the microphone. The closer he got, and he came, he gave a good word. Nothing wrong with the word he gave. So when we got done with service, we were driving home, and I'm crying. I said to Tom, I said, I'm just, I'm so critical. I'm so judgmental. I said, I just really need you to pray for me. And I told him my reaction to this man that was, in our, that was in our service that night. And he said, well, he said, honey, this is going to be a good growing experience for you because that man talked to me after the service and said he plans on start coming to our church. So I knew that I was going to have to start growing in love, walking in mercy, maturing in my character in Christ. Except that, after three weeks in our church, it was discovered he had seduced three young women and taken all their money. How many think I maybe should have just hit him that first night, okay? <laughs> See, he wasn't there for help. He wasn't there for any good purpose. He was a wolf. Okay? So we have to be able to discern. It says that there's, that there's uh, in, in everything there is wisdom, there is uh, discernment for judgment or for mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And nine times out of ten, we need to respond mercifully. But there are times that God says, that's a wolf, and there's no redemption there here. So my husband had to go and confront the man and basically say, I hope you get help, but it won't be here. Okay? So when it comes to to, to dealing with this, there's a scripture, and I don't have it in my notes, but there's a scripture in the New Testament where Paul says, beware of false brothers and false sisters, okay? We've got be, to be aware that there are times that there's somebody that's sent, but we've got to be able to discern, God, what is your plan for this person? Because there are broken, dysfunctional, messed up people that are going to come in in this next wave of revival, and if we just draw a line and go, you know what? You're a mess. Jesus can't do it. You must be a wolf. Then we're going to start throwing the revival out. Come on. Do we have the grace to deal with messed up people? Our, our, our deacon team are our key watchmen. They watch. 
And they come to me and say, Pastor Jane, that lady over there is a witch. I said, good, let's pray for her. Let's pray that God speaks to her, that God ministers to her, that God visits her in the service, that God sets her free. Can we get a different mentality about the way that, that discernment should function? Now, listen, this comes after years of dealing with feeling critical and judgmental. Okay? God married me to a man that's so, so merciful. How many of you know my husband? How many of you know my husband? Very merciful. How many know Bishop Hammond? So merciful. And um, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell on myself, um, we had this guy that was in our church, and this, again, was in my early days of learning how to handle discernment. And this guy was, I mean, he was a, he was divisive. He was a disruptor. I wouldn't necessarily call him a, a wolf, but he was just a very broken person and caused trouble pretty much wherever he went. And, um, and, and so he was going to leave our church. And so he sat and met with Bishop Hammond, my husband, and myself. And he had been doing a lot of talking, a lot of divisive things in the church. And so Bishop and Tom were meeting with him. I was, I was there as well. And, and so Bishop was leading the conversation. And he said, you know, well, we understand that you're leaving. But before you go, you know, I understand that you've had some issues that you've, that you, you've had that you've been critical that you've talked about this or that or pastor or the worship or whatever you know and the guy was like no no absolutely not I I love this church I love this I would never speak against this and so they went back and forth in that kind of a conversation for a while I am biting my lower lip to keep my mouth shut okay and Bishop's like, okay, well, let's just go ahead and pray for you and bless you. And the guy stops, and he turns to me, and he says, well, before we pray, Pastor Jane, I want to know what you think. And I used to think that if somebody said, I want to know what you think, they actually wanted to know what I thought. I mean, that's what, you know, that's what I thought. I thought, okay, they, they want to, I said, well, I was very unfiltered back then, Okay. I said, well, I think you've been sitting here lying, I, and I said it like this, lying through your teeth <laughs> to every question that Bishop's asked you. And I saw Bishop and Pastor Tom go. How <sighs> I many know just because you discern it doesn't mean you say it, okay? <laughs> I saw them both go. <sighs> and the guy about came, after, uh, came at, you know, across the desk at me, you know. And he was very angry, and the whole meeting blew up, you know. <laughs> There's this little scripture that says, speak the truth in love. And my husband had to teach me, you know, babe, there's, there's nicer ways to call somebody a liar, okay? You could say, I don't think you've been entirely honest. Come on, how many know there's nicer ways? I had to learn that. I had to learn. See, I'm very black and white. I'm wearing black and white, okay? I'm very black and white. It's either black or it's white. There's not a whole lot of gray area, okay? My husband sees nothing in black and white. It's all gray. He likes to say rainbow, all the other colors of the spectrum, okay? But how many know that neither view is entirely right? And God loves to marry somebody like me to somebody like my husband. He says, behold the goodness and the severity of God. God likes to put one person that's goodness and the other person that's severity. How many of you are married? Wave your hand at me if this is true, okay? And, it, and if you're not married to them, God will team you with somebody that's exactly opposite from you. Is this true? And you'll spend the rest of your life trying to change that person to think like you rather than understanding the blessing and the benefit of teamwork. See, I had to learn mercy. 
my husband had to learn that if there's a wolf, you don't have mercy on a wolf. The way that somebody that's very black and white views life is that we almost immediately have an opinion about everything, which is not always good. And even if you're discerning, it's not always right. Nevertheless, we do have an opinion. We know what we think. We know what we feel immediately. My husband processes. He takes in a lot of information. He processes. So somebody that's like me views somebody that's like him as. (sighs) Make a decision. Somebody that's like him views somebody like me as. You're really unwise. You haven't taken in all the information yet. You don't have all the information to make a decision or to make a judgment. And how many know that we can put us at odds? Rather than listening to one another and valuing the gift that's in that other person to get the full counsel of God. For example, when we go to the grocery store to buy ice cream. I walk up to the ice cream aisle, I look and say, "Mm, mint chocolate chip, that sounds good. I put it in my basket, and I go and pay. My husband has to study all the brands. He has to decide which one is the best, which one is the best deal. When he narrows it down, then he usually brings home two or three because he couldn't decide on one. No, he says, isn't two or three better? Yes, two or three are better, but I'm just giving you the difference in the way that we process information because it'll inform us about how we process revelation. Because you see, people that have a mercy motivation in their, in their, their DNA are going to view the exact same piece of revelation differently than somebody that has a little bit more of the judgment and severity. So just be honest. How many of you tend to be more like my husband? No fair asking your spouse. How many of you tend to be more, you, you're more mercy motivated? It takes you, you like to process. You don't just make a snap judgment. Okay, all right. How many of you are more like me? Yep. Jumping to their feet, both hands in the air. Yeah, I see you. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you what that looks like from up here. I say, how many of you are more like my husband? And this is what it looks like. Before the words, how many are like me, are out of my mouth, you're jumping to your feet. Okay, now let's be honest. How many of you did not raise your hand? Raise your hand, yeah, raise your hand. It's because you're more like my husband, I just didn't give you enough time, okay? Okay. How many of you just discovered you're married to your opposite? Now listen, 
as you grow over time, I learned wisdom. I learned mercy. Matter of fact, I would pray for mercy. I would say, God, you know, Micah says, you know, what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. God, I want to love mercy. God, help me love mercy. This was my prayer. God, let me love mercy. How many believe God is a merciful God? How many believe mercy triumphs over judgment? How many believe that God ultimately wants to save, redeem, heal, deliver, set free? Amen. God, let me love mercy. Let me look at people through eyes of mercy. And then one day the Lord said to me, oh, Jane, you love mercy when you're the one that needs mercy. I'm just asking you to give people the benefit of the doubt and to give them the same opportunity to get set free, healed, and delivered that I've given to you. So that was for all of you that were raising both your hands. Is that discernment is never an excuse to treat people with disrespect. Even if they're a wolf, you can respectfully throw them out of your church. No, I'm serious. I mean, if they're, if they're not looking to get healed or anything, I, I'm just saying. Sometimes mercy is asking the wolf to leave to protect the people. Sometimes that's mercy. Amen? That's mercy on the people. This is just one small area of discernment. Discerning what's happening in the human spirit. And listen, we've got to guard our hearts. Watchmen have got to guard our hearts. We've got to always allow love to be our motivator, okay? Because sometimes it's very hard when you're very black and white or you see things operating in people's lives, it's very easy to become critical and judgmental. And so what we've got to allow our hearts to do is, I think it's Philippians chapter 1 says, uh, may God increase you in love and all discernment. He partners it together in the same scripture. How many want to be increased in love? How many want to be increased in discernment? For us to be increased in discernment, we must be increased in love. Part of the reason we're not operating in a higher level of discernment is because we're not operating in a higher level of love. And we become more dangerous. Come on. We become more dangerous because we don't see things through the eyes of redemption. Ouch, right? God wants to increase us. But he wants to increase us in love so that we can deal rightly. So discerning the human spirit. Number two, discerning our own hearts. First Kings chapter 3. Solomon is just ascending to the throne as David has just died. Already, there's been a coup His brother, Adonijah, crowned himself king. He had to have his brother killed. He had to have David's general killed. He had to have David's priest banished. This is not a super good start to his kingship, right? And yet he was anointed and appointed by God. So he goes up to Gibeon to offer sacrifices up there. And as he offers all these sacrifices, he has a dream that night. And in 1 Kings chapter 3, the Lord comes to him in a dream and says, Solomon, what is it I can do for you? And Solomon says, Lord, you see that I'm I'm taking over some, I'm filling some pretty big shoes, but I'm just a child. I don't know how to rule this people. I don't know how to do what's right. Give your servant a discerning heart, a heart of wisdom, a heart that operates in true justice and leadership so that I can rule your people well. Solomon asked for wisdom. He asked for discernment. Why? Because his heart was insecure. Because he knew that God was bringing him to a new positioning of leadership. How many believe that God wants to mantle you for leadership in this next season? Come on, we need to understand that God wants to mantle us for influence. That's what a leader is. It's an influencer. Whether you become an influencer in your job, an influencer in the church, an influencer in your community, God wants to mantle us for influence. But in order for him to do that, we've got to pray this same prayer. God, give me wisdom. God, give me discernment so that I can rule the people well. So that I can lead the people well. 
And it says the thing that Solomon asked for, all this is going on in a dream. The thing that, this, that Solomon asked for pleased the Lord. And God said, because you've asked for discernment and wisdom in administering justice, and you've not asked for wealth or riches or the life of your enemies or any of these other things, <laughs> I'm going to give you all those things, but I'm also going to make you the wisest man that ever lived. Wouldn't it be great if all the prayers that we spent on money, positioning, opportunity, instead were spent on, God, give me wisdom. God, give me discernment. God, let me become a strong leader. Come on. God said, if you'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things will be added unto you, right? But Solomon had to deal with his own heart. See, many times we, we think that discernment looks like this. And if discernment looks like this, we've got to remember there's all these other fingers pointing back at us. We've got to use the gift of discernment to discern our own heart. This is where dreams and visions come in because I tell you what, God has <laughs> laid the hammer on me and things in my own heart that I wasn't taking care of through a dream or a vision. Because we need to understand that Proverbs tells us the heart is deceptive. A man that trusts his own heart is a fool. So our heart will tell us all day long, you're doing great. When God says, yeah, except for this little major area of sin in your life. What about this issue of unforgiveness in your life? Come on, what about these issues in your life? God has taken me through a process. Listen, watchmen need to learn how to listen to the voice of God, to discern what's going on around you, but also to discern your own heart. Because, listen, when a watchman's heart gets out of alignment, we don't see right. So God wants to deal with our heart. God wants to deal with our heart to, to keep us in this place of victory, to keep us in this place of purity. And I could tell you a number of dreams. They're, it, the stories are in my Dreams and Visions books, but how God actually used dreams and visions to deal with my heart. Remain, maintaining a humility. Just because you see, listen, <laughs> Balaam's donkey saw more than Balaam saw. The demons saw more than the disciples saw. So seeing does not make you a spiritual giant. We've got we've to maintain a humility in our walk with God so that we can become powerful. Amen? So we've got to be able to discern our own heart and the issues of our own heart so that we can stay in right alignment with God. Alignment is going to be more and more important as the days go by. Because there's going to be a lot of things that are pulling people. A lot of opinions, a lot of stuff that's happening. And we've got to keep our hearts in right alignment with the Word of God and with the Spirit of God. So number one, discerning human spirits. Number two, discerning our own heart. Number three, discerning the times. We need to discern the times. Listen, if all you're doing is listening to the news, you're not going to clearly discern what God is saying. Because <laughs> you're just going to get depressed at all the garbage that's going on. But I'll tell you what my Bible says. My Bible says, uh, Isaiah chapter 60, this is where we're living, right here. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For darkness will cover the earth, deep darkness will cover the people, but the Lord will rise on you. Put your hand on your belly and say, God is rising on me. And his glory will be seen on you. Then the nations will come to your light. Come on, the darker it gets, the more opportunity we have for the glory of God to rise and shine and to shine brightly. Amen? Listen, do you realize that the first two great awakenings happened at some of the most dark, depressing, and desperate times in our nation's history? We were, both times, we were extremely divided. Both times, our economy was failing. Both times, even leaders in the church weren't saved. That's that Vashti church I was talking about. There was a spiritual crisis. It wasn't an economic crisis. It wasn't a political crisis. It was a spiritual crisis. How many know we've lost our way as a nation because we're in a spiritual crisis? 
The division that's happening is not a political crisis, it's a spiritual crisis. If we got our spirit right, how many understand a lot of these other things would just work out? So, my husband and I, we just got back this week from doing a conference in Hawaii. I know it's really sad. Somebody has to do it. <laughs> we do it every year. We've done it for 20 years. We go over and we do a lot of work. We prophesy. We preach till our guts hang out. Um, it's really, it's actually quite exhausting. But, so we found out that we have to go in early to actually see the island. I grew up there, so we go in early and I spend some time where I grew up. And um, so a few years back, um, you know, we, just, we decided that every time we went to Hawaii, we were going to do a hike. Now, I am not hiker girl, okay? Like, we don't hike any other time of our lives. But my husband decides we are going to hike, okay? We've hiked Diamond Head. We've hiked Cocoa Head. Cocoa Head is like this. It's straight up, okay? Um, anyway, I won't tell you about that, okay? So I begged my husband, can we do an easier hike this time? And so we went up this Manoa Valley, which is a really nice hike. It's supposed to be about 45 minutes and hiking up through this valley to a waterfall. And it was absolutely beautiful. So we started out, but we started really late in the day. And we, we hiked up and we saw the waterfall, took some pictures, started hiking back. Well, at that time of the year, um, the sun was setting about 7.30 on the beach. And here was my first lesson, that the sun sets quicker in a valley than it does on the beach. So there was sudden, rapid darkness. We were walking down the trail, and it was light, and all of a sudden, it was dark. I mean dark, dark, dark. Is, doesn't that feel like what's happened in our country? Like we're going along, and all of a sudden, man, it is dark. It was so dark, I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. Now, let me just describe the trail. The trail was, has a mountainside on this side and about a 40-foot ravine. So, I am not moving forward. Because it's dark. And that has been the state of the church. Darkness encroached, and the church stopped because we have a hard time seeing our path. Watchmen see the path. Watchmen see the path. So I'm literally, I'm literally standing there, and my husband goes, babe, we got to keep moving. We can't spend the night here. And I'm saying, why can't we spend the night here? Okay, I can't see. This is dangerous. How many know it's dangerous to walk in the dark and not be able to see? Do you understand the call of the watchman now? It's dangerous to walk in the dark and not be able to see. And so while we stood there in the dark, we're starting to move forward. And I mean, I'm taking little tiny baby steps. We are not advancing quickly. I'm moving very, very slowly because we can't see. When all of a sudden it dawns on us, we've got iPhones in our back pocket. Now, it was pitiful because they were old iPhones. And they didn't have the flashlight built in. So this is way back, you know, like we were in the four stage, okay? And so what you actually had to do is you had to download a flashlight. So we stood there in the middle of the trail and downloaded flashlight apps. Listen, when it gets so dark that you can't see, the first thing you need to do is stop and download some light, download some revelation, okay? Quit just trying to move forward when you can't see and stop and download some revelation that will give you an ability to advance. But these were pitiful flashlights. iPhone 4 flashlights. They were like a little tiny pinprick of light. But here's where I learned my second lesson. A little tiny bit of light drives out a whole lot of darkness. All you need is a little bit of light. And a little bit of light and darkness gave us an ability to start advancing. Now, we were still going slow, but we were advancing. We were going to get there. We weren't going to spend the night in the valley. Okay, like maybe I thought we were before. We're now starting to move forward. When all of a sudden, out of the woods, comes these two Hawaiian men. And they've got flashlights strapped to their forehead. So it's dark, but they don't care because they've got these big beams of light. And they're just walking along. We said these were our Hawaiian angels, okay? They come out of nowhere, 
with all this light, they come up to us on the trail. They said, oh, looks like you guys could use some help. They reach into their backpacks. They pull out for each of us these giant flashlights, put them in our hands, and they take off down the trail. And my husband and I stood there, and we went, were those angels? How many understand that, that from that point forward, we could actually really advance quickly? We could move quick. Do you, do you see the analogy of where we're at as the body of Christ? And when we end up needing angelic help, God will send angelic help to us. I don't know if those were angels that carried flashlights in a backpack or not. But I'm telling you that God is sending angels in this season of time. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 says that God sends angels to assist those who are to inherit salvation. Now listen, we can talk all day long about discerning demons. And that's mostly how we've applied the gift of discernment. But let me just challenge you for a minute and say that there were twice as many angels as there are demons. Only a third of the angels fell. That means that angels outnumber demons two to one. So we ought to be seeing angel activity twice as often as we're seeing demonic activity. We need to be discerning what the angels are doing over a region. I love what Apostle Peter said. He said, Lord, we pray that there's a ladder here. That angels are ascending and descending. How many believe that you can actually pray that God would create a portal over your state, create a portal over your church, create a portal over your region, that angels are ascending and descending? We've got to discern angelic activity without getting weird. Look at your neighbor and say, quit being weird. Okay, no. How many know that God is increasing angelic activity? And as watchmen, we've got to be able to know not just what demons are doing. We've got to know what angels are doing. Beyond that, we've got to know what God is doing. Because do you realize that God will allow darkness to cause light to shine brighter? God wants to show the watchman how to position ourselves, how to pray prayers that bring heaven down. God wants to show watchmen how to move in a way that we cooperate with God's heavenly mandate. And we pull it. Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done where? Where? In New Jersey? In New York? In this region, as it is in heaven. What that literally means in Greek is that he's, he teaches them to pray, Lord, superimpose heaven on earth. In other words, make New Jersey look like heaven. It's the garden state, so... The world, we got to get over this, guys. The world does not belong to the devil. He's the God of this world, but that refers to the world's systems. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all they that dwell therein. Watchmen and prophets discern what is necessary to open the heavens and pull heaven down to earth. In Isaiah chapter 45, verse 8, it says this, Rain down, you heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. That's the picture of an open heaven. Do you realize open heaven is not blue skies? Open heaven is rain, because rain is what produces the harvest. Rain down, you heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, and let righteousness spring up. Listen, We've been around long enough to hear all kinds of messages about open heavens. But I am no longer satisfied to talk about an open heaven that doesn't manifest in an open earth. 
if we've really got an open heaven, that means things are shifting, things are changing in the earth realm. Come on, an open heaven will produce an open earth. Say that with me, open heaven, open earth. Open heaven, open earth. We've got to get a view that we don't just want to sing about, pray about, prophesy about an open heaven. We want to see that open heaven manifested in change in the earth realm. Transformation of a territory. So, we moved to Florida 38 years ago. We moved between Panama City Beach and Fort Walton Beach in the panhandle of Florida, the world's most beautiful beaches. Our sand literally looks like a packet of sugar that's been poured in your hand. That's what our sand looks like. It's absolutely breathtaking, stunning. When our children were little, we would dress them up in winter coats and put them on the beach and take pictures of them. It looked like they were in the snow, okay? It was the sand, okay? But that you get desperate when you're in Florida, okay? So it was a beautiful place, beautiful, beautiful place, but completely undeveloped. When we moved to where God moved us to, we quickly discovered that our area, our territory, was completely overrun with cults and occult groups. Satanists, pagans, Santeria voodoo cults, witches' covens, psychic healers, psychic gurus, kind of you name it, we had it. You have to understand there was nothing else there. It was just that. And God took this little pioneering prophetic ministry, dropped us down into a territory completely overrun by the spirit of witchcraft and our prophetic word was basically fight or die <laughs> or leave. We had decapitated animals thrown on the doorstep of our church, thrown on the doorstep of our home, sacrificial blood spilled out on our property, curses written on our buildings. It freaked me out. I was like running to my Bible college books like, where did they talk about this in class? They do not teach you this in Bible college. So what do you do? And the Lord said to me one day, why are you so freaked out about this? He said, when are you going to believe greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world? When are you going to believe that one drop of the blood of Jesus is greater and mightier than any blood oath or blood sacrifice the enemy could possibly spill out against you? One drop of the blood of Jesus can break the power of the curse. I had to change my perspective. We had demons, astro, demons or humans, something, astral projecting into our homes. Beings. I didn't know anything about any of this. And we understood that we had to make a stand. And we fought, we prayed, we prayer walked, we did prophetic acts, we took communion on the land, we went out to strategic places, we worked the land, we walked the land, we warred over the land. We were diligent to care for the area that God had given us. Not just hide out in the four walls of the church, but actually get out there and start speaking something different over our territory. One by one, those groups moved out. I'm telling you, one by one, literally, um, and those groups actually know that they could no longer operate because of what that little church over there was doing. They actually know that. So that's why they started showing up at our meetings. Okay? Over a period of time, we saw every one of those groups leave. But then we had to deal with what was entrenched with them in the land, which was a spirit of poverty. And listen, New Jersey has a lot of wealth, but there's a spirit of poverty here. Because wealth isn't about how much money you have in the bank. Poverty is about that robbery that we talked about last night. God wants to break the spirit of robbery and the spirit of poverty. God wants to break the spirit so that New Jersey can come into the destiny and the purpose and the calling that God has called it to, to, to have a wealth creation anointing, a wealth creation state that breaks poverty on every level. Spiritual poverty, it breaks the darkness, it breaks off the things that where the enemy robs from us, okay? So 
we started praying about poverty in the year 2000. Um, we'd been praying all along, but in the year 2000, I, as a watchman, I was praying over our territory, and I was actually on a midnight watch, midnight to 3 o'clock in the morning is my best time <laughs> to hear from God. And I was at the church, and I was walking in our prayer room, and I was just saying, God, you know what? We've heard prophecies. We've had prophetic words about the transfer of wealth. We've had prophecies. But, Lord, we are, we are just stuck here. We need, we need something. Something needs to be dealt with. See, we were, of all the counties in Florida, there's 67 counties in Florida. In the year 2000, we were ranked number 64 out of 67 on the economic scale. In other words, we were one of the poorest counties in Florida. You know, all the stuff that went along with that. So I was saying, you know, Lord, we've been put here to change this. And so I said, but why aren't we seeing the change? And so the Lord gave me a scripture. And in the scripture, and you can read about it in my book, The, the Cyrus Decree, but I, and in, I think, uh, Discernment, I think, talks about it as well. The Lord gave us the understanding of two demonic strongholds that were over our, our territory and showed us a prayer strategy, how to prophetically open the heavens and open the earth in our area. And how to deal with this poverty structure that was over our land. And the first time that I preached on it, literally the sound system melted. Like the circuits melted into the board. I preached the whole message with no amplification, no microphone. Don't worry, I prayed over the sound system, okay? Because the second time I preached it in another church, the same thing happened. The third time, I mean, I'm a prophet, but I'm a little slow. The circuits melted, and I realized, you know what? This is something the enemy does not want to hear. Because it broke the spirit of poverty, and it released an anointing for prosperity in our land. And within 18 months of us beginning this strategy and God giving us this revelation, within 18 months, we went from being one of the poorest counties in Florida to becoming the fastest-growing real estate market, the wealthiest real estate market in the entire continental United States. Now, 22 years later, we are now listed, ranked, as one of the four fastest growing counties in all of America. And our county is now the top revenue producer in the state of Florida. Our school systems, which at that time were at the very bottom, they started to improve over the next several years. Our son-in-law just got elected to his third term. When he started, we were ranked 35th in the state. So that was in the middle. We'd already seen some improvement. This last year, we were ranked third in the state. Our police department is ranked third in the state. We're shooting for number one. We're the top revenue producer. Come on. How many believe that when the righteous stand up, when the righteous watch and pray and download heaven's strategy, there is nothing that is impossible. Come on. There is nothing that is impossible. God broke the yoke of poverty. God broke the, the yoke of, uh, uh, of witchcraft. And our area has an open heaven. And people are moving in by the droves because they want to live because we've changed the whole atmosphere of where we live. Before it was dark, it was oppressive, it was filled with infirmity, it was filled with, uh, with uh, the, the, the spirit of depression and poverty, mental illness, all these things. It's all shifted, it's all turned around because God has a people in that land that were willing to rise up and say, you know what? We believe that we can actually change this. We believe in the process of transformation. And if you want to find this in scripture, go to 2 Kings chapter 2 when Elisha was given the double portion mantle. The very th first thing he did with that double portion mantle is he went in and he broke the curse off of Jericho. He broke the, uh, the assignment of death and barrenness off the land. He broke it off the water system and he made the decree. No more death and barrenness and the water remained healed until this day. I'm telling you, God has anointed us to be transformation agents and that only happens as people start watching, people start praying, people start downloading strategies from heaven. No matter where you're from, God can enable you to hook up with other watchmen, other intercessors, other leaders, other reformers and form a coalition 
that can actually topple principalities and powers and bring in a whole new day that opens the heaven, opens the earth, and brings kingdom transformation. If you want to be a, a reformer, if you want to be a transformer, I want you to jump to your feet right now. And I want to pray for you. Matter of fact, get out of your seats. Come to this front area. I want to pray for you as we're wrapping this up today because I believe that God is opening up our eyes, opening up our ears. We heard it last night. We heard it earlier this morning. I believe that God is saying now is the time. We have no more time to waste. We have no more time to lose. We've got to get serious about this. And I just believe that God is going to anoint you for this time and for this season. I want you to lift your hands up all over this place and just begin to pray in the spirit. Now lift your hands really high if you want that same activation anointing that Bishop gave to me. I'm not saying it will manifest the same way, but lift your hands really high. Father, Lord, you lay your hands on them. You release to them, Father God, that which they need to see, to hear, to know, to be activated, to be equipped, to, to have wisdom and revelation. Ephesians 1, 17 and 18, Paul prayed for the church in Ephesus, and he said, listen, Ephesus is full of witchcraft. Ephesus is full of idolatry. Tree. Ephesus is the center of the world for magic training. Here's what you're going to need. You're going to need the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding can be enlightened and you can know what is the hope of your calling in Christ Jesus. So Father, right now, today, God, I thank you for activating a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Activating a discernment, oh God. Activating, Father God, a mercy gift in those that need it. Activate, Father God, the eyes that see, the ears that hear. Activate us, O oh God, to be able to see what is necessary to open the heavens over our region. Lord, activate in us what we need to see to activate that open heaven into our open earth, Father God, that will result in the transformation of territory, that will result in the salvation of families, that will result in a great awakening and a mighty harvest, God. God, that you desire to bring forth on the earth. God, strip our eyes. Uh, Father God, the curtain away from our eyes, the veil away from our eyes. God, those personal issues that keep us bound up, oh God. Now lay your hand on your brother, or your sister that's next to you. Father, we activate that right now in the name of Jesus. God, we acknowledge that we are not out here being lone rangers. God, we are not out here being lone rangers, God, that are expected to know it all, do it all, be it all, hear it all, see it all. But God, we are a corporate body. We are a united, anointed ecclesia. God, that is understanding your kingdom purpose. That is understanding, God, that we need one another. God, that strength is meeting strength. And that our brother and our sister's strength covers our weakness. And we are stronger when we're together, oh God. I thank you, God, that you're bringing this region into a season of iron sharpening iron. And as iron sharpens iron, sparks fly. And when sparks fly, fire starts. Lord, start a fire in this region. Start a fire in this region, a Pentecostal fire, a fire of awakening, a fire of awakening, God, a fire of revival. Send the Pentecostal anointing into this area again. Not like old Pentecost, but God, a fresh Pentecost, a new Pentecost, a new mantle, oh God. Lord, raise up reformers, raise up revivalists out of this region. Raise up reformers, raise up revivalists, oh God. God, wash our minds from the old religious mindsets about what revival looks like, God. Wash our minds for a new day. Anoint us, God, to have the strength to push, to see the tipping point happen in this area. 
and when shaking comes and when darkness encroaches, Father God, Lord, let us understand that it is our day to arise and shine, to wake up and to be set on fire, God, in this region, to topple systems of idolatry, to topple systems, Father God, that have been holding a nation captive, to overthrow thrones of iniquity, to see demonic structures over the region dismantled by the air war and by the ground war. The air war of intercession, the air war of the watchman release, the air war of wrestling with principalities and powers, but the ground war of winning souls casting out demons, healing the sick, setting captives free. Come on, guys, it can't be one or the other. It's got to be both and. So, Lord, I loose that double portion, the open heaven and the open earth, the air war and the ground war, Father God, the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation, the anointing for justice, but also the anointing for mercy, knowing that mercy triumphs over judgment. such an atmosphere of glory here. I want you just, for the next couple minutes, just listen. God's going to give many of you assignments. Come on, God's giving some of you assignments. First of all, I want to say God's breaking you out of the fear and out of the failure of your last season. so that you can receive the fresh assignment for the new season. Listen to the Lord. He's giving you assignments now. feel like you made a mess of some things. Come on, move forward from that. I'm standing here as living proof and testimony that God will use you even though you messed up. <laughs> Father, I strip off of them that demonic thing, God, that binds them to past mistakes, that binds them to perfectionism and makes them feel if they can't do it perfect, they shouldn't do it at all. I break it off, Lord. Something in this region, something in this region, God, it's because you've called this region to operate in excellence. There's an anointing for excellence in this region. But, Lord, excellence is not perfectionism. So, Father, I decree a deliverance from perfectionism that releases us into excellence. David had an excellent spirit. Daniel had an excellent spirit. So, Father, today we receive the anointing for excellence. Lord says, New Jersey, arise and shine. It has felt dark in this region. It's been a region where you have felt that darkness encroached and would not move. But the Lord said, arise and shine. Wake up and be set on fire. Let my glory rise in you. Let my glory rise in you because this is a day of harvest and you're going to see kings, leaders, CEOs, government leaders, leaders of industries come to the brightness of your 
rising. God says, I'm setting you up on your jobs. Because the unbeliever can see the light that shines out of you. I'm telling you, they can see it. They feel threatened by it, but there's going to be many that are drawn to it. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for that light that's rising in us. We break every yoke of fear. There's also a very strong spirit of intimidation in this region. It wants to intimidate you from opening your mouth and talking about the truth, talking about Jesus. Come on. So, Father, we break the spirit of intimidation, the spirit of fear off. We break the spirit of limitation off right now. We thank you, Lord, for your calling that this region is called to be a bold voice. A bold voice. Lay, just lay your hand on your vocal cords again. Lord, this, this region is called to be a bold voice. The enemy has had his bold voice in this region. But today, Lord, we activate the bold voice of your ecclesia, the full, bold voice of your people, God. Lord, we thank you, God, for giving wisdom and revelation on what to speak, how to speak. But God, an expansion and an increase of the voice of God that is going to resonate out of this region that's going to shatter the darkness. The voice of the Lord, Isaiah. Isaiah 30, 31, the voice of the Lord shatters the enemy. Lord, I thank you, God, for a prophetic anointing being released upon every man and woman here today. Every child, dreams and visions, activate, activate, activate that prophetic anointing, God, that we will prophesy. We will speak what God is saying, God, into every city that we live in. Go home. Here's your assignment. Go home and prophesy to your city. Go home and prophesy to your city. How many live within 30 miles of here? Go home and start prophesying over your town, over your city. Come on. Let's saturate the atmosphere with prophetic words. Let's saturate the atmosphere with decrees. Wherever you're from, we'll start seeing some things shift. There's going to be some a, a shifting of government leaders. Some are going to be voted out. Listen to me. Some are going to be voted out. Others are going to be removed. And we stop and we celebrate those things, but then we don't back it up by pushing. There's a shift that's taking place. But we got to understand the shift just means now it's time to start pushing as never before and get behind the new leaders God's put in there. So lift your hands up one more time. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for a fresh anointing and a fresh mantle so that we can obey you and do things we've never done before, but do it with wisdom and revelation to see powerful results of transformation every time. In Jesus' name. bless you all. Take what you received and hold tight to it and grow into it. I just speak a blessing over all of you that were hungry to receive everything the Lord wanted to tell us over this weekend. And we're not done yet. Elizabeth Tim Fook will be speaking tomorrow at our church service. And I just would love it if you could, uh, obviously, if you go to another church, you got to be in your home church. But for those of you that will be here we just uh, wanted to let you know, because Kim Owens couldn't be here uh, due to a death in the family, that Elizabeth will be preaching tomorrow. Anybody glad you came to this conference? <laughs> Me too. And I would never try to preach after Jane Hammond, so I'm just going to ask you to stand, and I'll just speak one blessing over you before you leave. <laughs> if you like what you heard, you can go on our YouTube channel, and we have a... a playlists of, of clips of Jane speaking. So there's, it's all free and it's easy for you to get it there. There's a lot of wisdom in her teaching. So Lord, we're just grateful for people who knew at a young age that they were called to be in the ministry. And in spite of all the opposition the enemy threw at the Hammond family, that they are still standing. Even Bishop Hammond at 88 years old, still preaching, still going around the world 
And it's not just preaching, it's also the impartation. So all the impartation that was released this weekend, Lord, we receive it right now by faith. Not just head knowledge, but an ability to move and operate more strongly in the gift of the prophetic and in the gift of discernment. And all the things that were revealed to us, Lord, we want to meditate and chew on them and speak them out into the atmosphere. The sword of the Spirit to be the spoken word of God out of our mouths and out of our lives. I pray, Lord, the investment that everybody made to be here this weekend will produce great dividends and great harvest in all of our lives. And I bless them as they go now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Love you all. Godspeed.